lot has happened this last year. Uh, Nathan's married to Hope, and Daniel's married to Hannah, and uh, we got a little Timothy back here. Lots of things happened in a year. What's going to happen in this next year? Are we ready for it? Brother Nathan, you come ahead and share what God has laid on your heart and help us to be ready for the coming year. song we just sang <clears throat> fits along as a good precursor to my message this morning. All times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. Our eyes get focused off of the big picture of what we're here for in life. What we're really trying to become, what God, what, we're, what God really has for us, because the little things of life, the day seems long, but Christ will soon appear to catch His bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus, if we've been faithful. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. When I was younger, just a little boy sitting in church, Hearing about all the heroes of the Bible. I had my heroes that I thought were great men. <clears throat> and I always wondered how they could have such great men back there in the Bible days. Wish we could live in those days. You'd have men of faith like that. Noah, Daniel, Job, Abraham, Moses, Joseph. Think of what Joseph went through. David. But as I got older, the reality of what it's really like came in and I realized the men who lived with these men in those days didn't value it for what it was because they were just ordinary men. The true secret to these men's success was hidden from most, or what they really were, was hidden from the eyes of most of the people they were around because they were so familiar with what they had that they didn't appreciate either. And they were probably looking back at the great days of the heroes before them. And so, if you're a young man this morning, and you look at the Bible heroes and think something similar to that, I want you to know that there's no reason why you can't become like your Bible hero. That's right. But it's going to start today, tomorrow, the next day. It's going to be a life of choices from your young age up. Don't let sin get in the way. <clears throat> These men have a great report. There's many of bad reports in the Bible. They have a great report in the Bible, many of them. And you can get that same report at the end of your life when it's examined. You could have be looked back on and have a good report, and people could look back and go, Wish I could have lived in the days of so and so. Look at all the good that got done. Or you can be one of those who just blended into the history and didn't become anything because you didn't value what you had. I want to look at what was truly the secret for these men to become what they became, the recipe for their good report, 
And I want to talk about it this morning, and I want you to listen close, and I want you to make a determination in your heart to become like that, to take that recipe, to put it to practice in your life. I was thinking, I've got a report card from when I was in school, and I found it the other day. <clears throat> and some of it I'm okay with, and some of it it's not so great. It's possible if I could have had all my school friends fill out this report card, it could have looked a little bit better. Probably it would have pumped my ego a little bit more because we could have negotiated and I could have wrote good in theirs, they could have wrote good in mine. But unfortunately that's not the way things work in real life. And it's not the way it works in the Christian life in real life either. A lot of people, the Bible talks about the necessity to have a good report. That's a requirement for deacons to have a good report from them that are without, lest he fall in the reproach and snare of the devil. What if he falls in the reproach and snare of the devil while trying to get a good report from them that are without? You think he missed something? I think a lot of people, in an effort to try to get a good report, what they think is a good report from them that are without, they fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. That's right. They never become what they think they're trying to become. In Proverbs 15.30 says, The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. So in my report card, some places need improvement, some places are satisfactory. I notice I never got an excellent progress. <laughs> that was sad. <clears throat> in reading, I started out 99%, then it went to 98%, then it went to 95%, and then it went to 82%. I don't want your Christian life to look like that. You know why it did that probably? Because I was stuck at a certain level. And as the year progressed, they were trying to put me to a higher level. And I wasn't learning very well. And so, my grades were getting a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. I went up to a certain point and it wasn't getting better. And in some of my other studies it was similar. In math I did real well. But phonics it did a similar thing. Because I couldn't keep up the pace. I, they were trying to grow me up. So at one point I had a good grade. And my report card looked good. But as the reports came out some things were getting worse. <laughs> and in your Christian life, at some point in your life, it may be going good. You might have a really good grade on your report card if you knew what it was. But the Christian life is a life of schooling. And it's trying to take you to the next grade. Right. To the next level up. It's teaching you more new things. So if you're doing good right now and somebody says you're doing really good, don't say, okay, well, I'm going to stay right there. Don't do that. Maintain the attitude. Maintain the diligence that it took to get there. But keep learning. Because what I want you to have on Judgment Day is a good report. Just like your heroes in the Bible. And it might surprise you if you just set out to serve God and take this recipe that we're going to talk about this morning from the days when you're young or wherever you find yourself this morning. And take this recipe that the Bible gives for how these men got this good report. On Judgment Day, you're going to be able to stand right up beside them if you were faithful. And you're going to find out that in God's eyes, you became one of the faithful, just like your Bible hero was. One thing the devil can do to keep you from ever becoming a hero, or ever becoming like your hero, is to defeat in your mind the possibility of ever getting there. And that's what Daddy was talking about this morning. Don't, don't worry about who your father is, of whether you can beat him, or whether you can outshine him, or whatever. Let that affect the, That's a selfish mindset to even, that's a wrong basis to even operate on. But if the devil can get you thinking, oh, those were great guys. He's got a lot of people in society admiring good people, admiring Bible characters, admiring Christian families and how wonderful they are. But they don't get there because he has them defeated in their mind that they could ever do it. Right. And so that's another successful tactic that he uses to keep people where they are. Because you can't ever become that. You're nobody. Well, God created each of us. And he created us and gave us the same rules 
and he has the same plan for each of us to be conformed into his image. It's not for some to do it and others just can't. We can all do it and he expects it of us. And if, he, if you could not, then he would be unjust to expect it and demand it, but you can't. And so he's just in doing so. <clears throat> so I'd like you, as I, as I read over some of the things that I'd like, uh, that would be possibly on your Christian report card, and if I had better writing on the board, I might venture to write it up there, but I would rather you just listen to what I had to say and kind of grade yourself. What, what would God put on my report card? Would it be satisfactory progress? Would it be needs improvement here? Would it be excellent progress? Would it be a 99? Would it be, what would it be? And so on God's report card for you that he's filling out, probably at different stages of your life, he's keeping track of everything you have. How are you when it comes to unspotted from the world? And I mean that by its value systems. And you can be a little boy, you can be a little girl, and still carry the world's value system by trying as much as you know how, as much as you get of the world's lingo, you admire the world's lingo, and when you hear a new phrase, when you hear something that sounds, oh, that sounds tough, and that sounds something worldly, you have a tendency to gravitate towards it. Yeah. I've seen that in little fellows, I've seen that in little people, and I've seen it in middle-aged people, and I've seen it in adults. A tendency to gravitate towards the things of the world as much as I know. You're going to be limited. As time goes on, that limitation that you have is going to be less, and you're going to have more opportunity to show what's in yourself. So... How would it come out? What does God see in your heart when you are in, when you are confronted with the world and its philosophy and its value system and what's right? And you have to think about it. Do you have a tendency to gravitate one way or the other? How would he grade you? What about your personal devotion time on your report card? Your personal devotion time. Is that satisfactory progress? Excellent progress? Or does it need improvement? Personal, I'm not talking about when daddy says, come in here and sit down, it's 8 o'clock, it's time for Bible time, and you say, okay, and you come for Bible time. I'm talking about when you, of your own accord, lose sleep, whatever you need to do, get up earlier to read your Bible and pray, and a personal devotion time, and a personal talk with God. How's God marking that on your report card? This report card is going to determine an eternal destiny for you someday. Right. And it's all going to seem... Like such a short amount of time back there on earth when I could have been so when I could have been good when it goes into eternity. It's gonna be like, oh, it was so quick. I just lived for a little amount of time. The day seems so long, the trial seems so hard to bear. That's the devil. He's trying to discourage you. It's not really that long. There's many of these people, all these people in the Bible look back. What do you think they think? The, that was such a it's so worth it. Or I was such a fool. About when it comes to your Bible memory. Do you do Bible memory because you're told you have to? Or do you do it because you love the Word of God? Does God see in you a hunger and thirst after righteousness? How is your prayer life? You have an opportunity in your prayer life to speak with the Creator of the universe. What an opportunity that is. Amen. Just think about it. Like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who created the world. The God who spoke to Moses. That same God who your heroes were communicating with. They didn't communicate with God and become what they became until they were well into their life and had lived a long life of walking this way that we're going to talk about this morning. It has to start now. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to be good for a few years, and if God doesn't talk to me or do something special, I'm done. No, sorry, that's not going to work. You're going to be done. Not the way it works. You need to not be worried about becoming like somebody else. You need to be worried about becoming the best you can become for God if you're going to do this. Your prayer life. How much, how much do you take advantage of the wonderful opportunity to speak with your Creator? You know, sin in your life will greatly hamper the joy of a prayer life. So if you don't appreciate it or you don't enjoy it or it doesn't make you feel good to know I just talked with God and He heard me, then you need to examine yourself. How much do you delight in the law of the Lord when you read it and you read what he says, even when it corrects yourself? <clears throat> How faithful are you in giving the Lord his share of what he blesses you with? How grateful are you? How are you when it comes to paying attention in church? Trying to get a good report card? 
How are you when it comes to honoring authority? The Christian report card is going to be something like that, and you're going to have a grade. Now we're going to talk about what is the recipe for a good report. What would make what would help me to become that? And if you have this ingredient, you will become that. And it says in Hebrews 11, chap uh, chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance, the sure confidence of things hoped for. So what do you hope for? If you're hoping for this, faith is the sure confidence of things hoped for. The evidence or the certainty of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now, a lot of people understand the principle of faith and how faith has to be a part of a Christian life. You need to have the Christian faith. But a lot of people don't understand what's faith. Right. And so we're going to talk about this ingredient and we're going to make sure we understand what all goes into this so that we don't miss out on true faith and what it can do for us. So I'm going to talk about two aspects of faith that have to be in place before it's faith that God recognizes, before it's anything that the Bible, when the Bible says that by it the elders obtained a good report, it was they, they, that it included these two aspects. It wasn't a just, I, I acknowledge the fact that God exists. Uh, in James, it says, what did that profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? Can that mental knowledge of God that you claim to have, can that save you by yourself? Is that faith? If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you send him to part in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye them not those things that are needful to the body, what did that profit? You're just all talk. There's no action. If a man say he loved God and doesn't keep his commandments, the Bible calls him a liar. And that's the same thing he's doing right here. Right. If you go, go be warmed and filled, but you don't do anything. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, so here's the person that thinks that they can have faith without any action. So, I believe that there's one God. He says, Thou doest well. The devils also believe in tremble. They also acknowledge that there's one God. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And then he goes into Abraham as an example of being justified by works. And seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled to say that Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. Faith produces the works. It's the sure confidence. It's the back. It's it's what supports or acts upon the hope that you have. So we understand that if you have faith, it needs to work. We already understand that here. So I'm not going to I'm not going to overdo that topic. But understand that if you truly have faith in God, you're going to do what He says. Or you don't have faith. Right. Now, I want to talk about perhaps the most challenging aspect of this ingredient in this faith. Is the second aspect that I want to talk about. And it's where we end up getting discouraged. We end up falling short. And it would be in this area. We understand that it needs to work. But when does faith work? Is the challenge. And there's a, there's a story here in the Bible that explains it. And there's several situations. And the challenging part is when faith works is when it's is when it's tested. That's when it's when it's harder to have faith. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. This is when they need to cross over this Jordan. They've got a swelling Jordan, and they need to cross over the Jordan. And this is just an example to help young people understand what I'm talking about. And God tells it, they're, they're wondering, how in the world are we going to get over there and conquer Canaan? And God tells them, Tell the priests. To get the ark of the ark and bear the ark of the covenant, and walk down. And when you step into the water, then I'll hold the water back. And it came to pass when the people removed their tents, the whole congregation, active in faith, that this was going to happen. They didn't see that they didn't have to stand there and see that Jordan was going to be moved. They didn't have to see God play with the water. Yeah, He can do it. They had faith that it was going to happen. So they all pick up and they start heading towards Jordan. 
and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks at time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city of Adam. And the people all passed right over. But if the people had said, we don't really think so, I don't know, that's impossible. How, where would the water go? And start questioning all that God had said to do. This would have never happened. And so the real beauty of faith and what makes these people heroes like they are in this good report is the fact that when God said move, they move without right. seeing the results. Yes. And that's when faith is really tested. So no greater. Faith has to work. But faith works. And faith is the beauty of faith. And the proof of faith is when you can be told what to do by God and you act upon it in faith that, there's, that it's going to be worth it. Right. That the promise is going to come to pass. If you have to wait until you see evidence, it's not faith. Right. You're, you're a doubt, you're a, you don't have faith in God. <clears throat> but that's where it becomes very challenging. This is a simple scenario. There was probably a lot of work that went into the getting ready for this move. If the waters did not move, it would have been a lot of work to go back. But in our lives, there's many times when it's even a lot harder than just a day, a wasted day or two. Sometimes we're risking a whole lifetime of something or something else in this faith. And so you have to have a solid faith, and it's good to exercise this faith in every area of life and take God at His word so when the big test comes, you're already prepared to go. Right. You already have built up a faith in God that's willing to put everything at risk because I know from past experience that He'll come through on this. So that one, that one was successful. So then, <clears throat> the fall of Jericho, similar thing. He tells them, go, get your army together and go circle that city seven times, seven days. The city didn't fall, the city didn't shake until they were complete with their task. They, were, they had done everything they were told to do and showed that they had faith in God. They all operated, went through all the work of doing it, and then the city fell. So it's building up these people's faith. And in our lives, there's gonna be many times to, that we're asked to do something or that we do something and we're going to feel God's blessing or God's smile of approval and we're going to see God work things out for us in our lives and it's going to build our faith for the next trial. And the, the children of Israel had to deal with that as well, but I'm trying to do that in this message. These are, these are small examples where there was a lot of work involved. This was a small thing though for the children of Israel. There was bigger tests ahead and many of them failed those bigger tests. I'm a, I've worked it a little bit here to where you understand the principle. Now let's look at someone, one of our Bible heroes, or a few of our Bible heroes, who passed a really big test. And we're going to turn to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 14, and we're going to read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who passed a major test of faithfulness. And these men didn't, didn't come to this point any other way, but then step by step, day by day, their walk of faith, building that faith in their heart from the time they were young boys and young girls, or what these guys were young men, young people who walked that walk of faith and built it up in their lives so they when this test came they were ready for it without any delay and they became major figures that are that were my heroes growing up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego formerly known as Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael <coughs> for the Hebrew names so Daniel chapter 3 beginning of verse 14 Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them is it true O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you should be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, of course, we all know what happened, and we know that they did the right thing, and so we'd like to think that we'd do the same thing. But if we can't even tell ourselves no, we're going to finish reading it here in a second. If we can't even tell ourselves no when we have a little bit of wonder on the line or a little bit of pride at risk or something like that, giving up something very temporal, these people were not being asked to give up their worldliness. Right. These people were being asked to give up their life in a burning fiery furnace. So this isn't even talking, we're talking about, yeah, it takes faith to renounce all your sin and all your worldly appetite and keep yourself unspotted from the world. That takes faith and trust in God to do that. But these people have moved way beyond that. 
This is major. These people have walked that walk. They did that a long time ago. And so now in their life, when they're ready for the big test, when they could blow it right here, they pass. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They didn't think about it. They'd already, they already knew their answer. <coughs> if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should fast, uh, yeah, sorry, that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was one to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And those men were bound into their, in their coats, their hose, and their hats and their other garments, and were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And because it was so hot, it slew those men who were the mightiest men of his whole, uh, army. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave great glory to God that day because they passed that test. They didn't pass the test because God had came and told them that he was going to spare them out of the fire. And he's not always going to spare them out of that fire. Right. Eventually, they will be spared out of the fire. They will be spared eventually. And that's why in Hebrews 11, it says, And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging. Yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted. It goes on, it says that they might obtain a better resurrection. And they will get that. They didn't, God didn't stop all of the pain. And you, He won't stop it all for you either. Occasionally, He might or He might not. But we don't act in faith based on that. Well, if you do this, I'm going to do this, hoping that if He does that. If God doesn't do that, I'm done with God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell every kid as a no, so that he, and he can put me in the furnace, but if I get burned, I'm not going to be happy. God let me down. No. There's been many people who acted in faith, and they're not going to regret it. And when it comes to Judgment Day and they see Christ, it will be worth it all. <clears throat> it's the true test of faith. Being able, it, it, it is faith. It cannot be called faith if it does not act, and if it does not act in faith before the outcome is evident. And so the king ends up promoting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon and saying that if anybody speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, she's going to be cut in pieces and her house is going to be made a dunghill because there's no other god that can deliver after this sort. Brought great glory to God. Just what would have happened and how many people in history have blown an opportunity like that where God could have acted? But due to fear and the lack of faith in God, the lack of steps of obedience up to that point where it could have gone so good, they failed it. Well, we don't know. But we know there's just a few that did out of a lot of people. And there's one instance that would have really helped to prepare them for this scenario. And that would have been when... They were with Daniel. And they were going to defile themselves with the king's meat. And so, they're in a situation where they've been carried away captive. Did God let them down? They probably haven't been treated that well. They're slaves in the king's palace. <coughs> but because they had this walk with the Lord, and this is earlier on in their days, not too much earlier, but it definitely would have been the steps that led to this great act right here of faith. They come to a point where they're not going to defile themselves with the king's meat. Doesn't matter. Maybe you don't understand, but maybe you do. The ramifications of a slave saying, no, I'm not going to defile myself with your meat. The kind of slander that puts on their master and you're their slave. It wouldn't have been okay to do that except the fact that it was staying right with God. And they, were, they understood the chain of authority. And they understood that I'm not going to get out of line with God to save my neck here. It would have been very easy to have gotten bitter at God. It would have been very easy to have all kinds of justification of why I'm in a bad situation. But it says that he purposed in his heart that he would not. He purposed in his heart that he would not. And that's what we're going to have to do. Everybody has to purpose in their heart. I will not become prey to the devil and his tactics to the devil and his lures for me his lures for you aren't going to look nasty they're going to look nice 
God's way has it to where you act in faith, you love His way, you do what you're supposed to do, and there's a blessing at the end. The devil's way is every time there's some place where you have to act in faith, the devil's going to be right there. It's always his prime opportunity to act is when your faith is being tested because there's a, something that you're asked to do that's painful, but there's a blessing at the end. He comes in and tries to stand there, and I got something for you. And he, he has a way of lying to you, offering you something that looks more pleasant, See, it shows you that there's a way out of this and promises maybe the same reward or it won't be so bad for you. But his, the end of his way is death and destruction. There's no blessing at the end. <clears throat> his promises are empty. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were prepared for this because of those previous steps that we get a glimpse of here and there. And I'm sure that there was a lot more. Right. So in Hebrews 11, chapter 1, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we're going to read that chapter. And I want you to notice as I read through here how many times it talks about the faith and when it was given. And I'm going to emphasize that a little bit. So we're going to see it's, it's, it's a thing that everybody goes, yeah, that's a no-brainer. We all understand the principles, so why are we talking about it? Well, I'd like to know if we all understand the principles, why do we fail so many times in these areas? And while we still claim to be Christians, we know the principles, but we still claim to be Christians, but we still lack faith because right. we're still failing in these areas. If we didn't lack faith, if we didn't, or, or lack the understanding, we know we have to have faith. If we, didn't, if we didn't lack understanding on what faith is and what we're talking about this morning, then why are we doing, why do we continually see people fall away and go here and go there? And after they go out of the door and go falling into their sin, it's too late to talk to them then. So we're talking about it this morning. So you're not surprised. So you understand when the, that when the temptation comes, when the trial comes, and the temptation is right there, you know what to do if you want to become like these men. <clears throat> they didn't get here by accident. God didn't pick them out of the history and just decide to make them good. So in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance, and like I said, like it says in uh, Tyndale's translation, the sure confidence of things hoped for, the evidence or the certainty of things not seen. Faith is what acts upon the hope that it has. It's what makes you act. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. He obtained witness. He obtained a report, a good report, that he was righteous. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. God never told him, Enoch, if you get a testimony before me that you please God and you walk with God, I'll translate you. I'll, I'll take you out and make a great, um, make, give you a great uh, blessing that many people don't get if you'll walk before me and get this testimony. God didn't tell him that. Before his translation, because he loved God, he pleased God. And he had a testimony before all the world that he pleased God and he had a good report. Now, do you think the people of the world liked him so much? And Enoch, all through the sevens from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute wrath upon all to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. You think Enoch had a... The neighbors all thought he was a nice guy and pleasant to be around? Well, no, but he had a reputation. He had a testimony that he pleased God. And the Bible says... For by it, the elders obtained a good report, and he's right here near the top of the list. <clears throat> but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder than the diligently seek him. Without this ingredient that has these ingredients of working, moving when you're told to move, not questioning God, not waiting till you have to see the outcome or waiting to see if it works or setting your own determination on what works and doesn't work, but just doing what you're told, when you're told, with the right attitude, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. God doesn't like someone who stands back and questions and doubts and 
He's, he's not out to prove anything to you. Right. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear. And by faith he obtained a good report. By the which he condemned the world. I want you to keep in mind what a good report is. We need to be striving for a good report. But keep in mind that these people, the Bible says these people had a good report through this faith. And most of the people that the Bible says had a good report or that walked with God, many of them were persecuted all alone, got their head chopped off, got sawn asunder, were slain with the sword. So we need to understand, a good report from them that are without doesn't necessarily mean they're all going to speak well of you. You beware when all men speak well of you. But a good report doesn't mean they think you're the nicest, most likable guy to be around. But a good report in God's eyes is that man has a testimony that he pleases God. You know, I don't like really what he's saying, but I do respect what he's doing. He pleases God. That's the only report you need to worry about. And that's a good report. And uh, verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Now Abraham was called to go out into this place, and after he got out there, and after he separated with Lot, then God said, I'm going to give you this inheritance. Right. Walk before me and be thou perfect. <coughs> Did Abraham ever get it? No. Abraham, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. This is my promised land that I'm going to inherit. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, his sons down the line, grandson, the heirs with him of the same promise. They were all promised this. They weren't serving God so that they could get land, because they never got land. They were serving God because they were serving God. God made this promise, and it happened to their seed. And he moved by faith. His faith wasn't set on a pre-existing, this is what I want, and I think faith will get me there. Right. It was, this is what God told me to do. He said, leave my family, leave everything I have, and go out here and serve me. I don't want you by these people. And he just moved. By faith he sojourned, let's see, for he, for he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And it was just fine with them to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth, because they were looking for a city. For they did say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And they didn't have any doubt in their mind that they were going to get it. But they weren't looking for this life. They weren't looking for comfort and pleasure and ease in this life. They were looking for the blessing of God. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that an Isaac shall I see be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up. He's able to do it. But this is what God told me to do. So you don't say, God, are you able to do it? Or, God, I know you're able to raise him up. Are you going to raise him up if I do this? He didn't do that. You talk about a major sacrifice and a major test of faith. We know these stories, and so they look so, we're so used to it. But you just put yourself in that position. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also we received him in a figure. He understood that what he had came from God and was God's, and that if God wanted it, he could have it. And you know what? If you come to that understanding in life, you've come to quite an understanding, if you're willing to give it. What you have, you are God's. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. He created you, and then whenever you, your fathers and got you in a situation where you were in banishment from God, 
And then through your own sin, you needed a Savior to get back in line with God. He prepared a way for you and bought you, gave you an opportunity to come back. You're not your own. And everything you have is a blessing from God. You didn't right. create it. And so when Abraham, he realized that. And so he was willing to give the ultimate sacrifice. His only son that he had gotten after waiting a hundred years. And being told he was going to get it. And so he was looking forward to it. <clears throat> that hope for a son had probably died a long time ago. And then it was all revived. And then God gave it to him. And he was willing to give it. Because he knew where it came from. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. It goes down talking about Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Who would do that? Who would make this life so miserable? No, but he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Right. It goes down and talks about the wall of Jericho after they were compassed seven days. Talks about Rahab the har harlot. When she took the spies with peace, risked her life to receive them because she had faith in the God of Israel. She didn't have as much reason to have faith in the God of Israel probably as you do today. Right. But she was willing to risk her life on it and, and we ended up saving her life in the process. But she didn't do it on that condition. She did it. And then she asked for mercy. I want you to more safe, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson of Jephthah of David also and Samuel of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, walked valiant in the fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. They gave the ultimate sacrifice of earthly possession. They gave everything they had that they might obtain a better resurrection. These people didn't just come to this test and somebody bring them to this opportunity and all of a sudden they just passed it without a life of commitment and walking from the day they were young. And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mounds and dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They all obtained that good report through that faith that made them stand strong through all these trials, these, all these situations where most people would have fainted along the way. Most people would have made it through this. These are your Bible heroes. These are the heroes of the past that had faith to stand in the face of great difficulty. And you know, really, if we think about it, our trials look pretty small compared to that. Compared to most of those, probably any of them. So, if you ever want to become great, or you ever want, and you don't need to do it to become great with anybody but God. If you please God, it doesn't matter who you displease. Amen. And so you want to have this testimony with God, you want to have a testimony that you please God, then start today, walking that walk of faith. Don't ever tell God no. When your conscience tells you to do something, do it. <coughs> to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It takes faith just to say, yes, Lord, and go. At any cost. Don't sit there and go, if you know what's right, don't sit there and go, what could, how could that affect me? How many friends would I lose? How much money would that cost? Could I lose my job? If you find yourself doing that, you've got a long ways to go before you're ever going to become this. Right. These people acted. These people, when they counted, why would you count the cost? What would be the point of counting the cost? So, to the point of questioning whether you're going to do it or not. The point would be, if it gets to any of the things that are too dear to me, then I'll reconsider obedience. That's the only point. It's one thing to go, you know what, I understand where this is going, but I'm going anyway. But the determination, understanding what it's going to, the effect this is going to have. Have an understanding, but don't, don't, 
Don't allow yourself the liberty to choose whether I'm going to obey. Tell yourself, purpose in your heart, I'm going to obey. And then do it. You do have a choice and you can disobey. But don't give yourself, don't teach yourself to have that liberty to sit there and wonder. If you do it with right. your parents, you're probably going to do it with God. So I would right. suggest you start there. And if you took a quick report of several men of the past, of David, Daniel, we've talked about him. And you look at people like Achan. In the midst of all this glory, in the midst of such opportunity, how foolish to blow it like that. Coveted a little gold and silver. You weren't paying attention. Right. You know, if, if he had just let that city, that first city, do what he's supposed to do there, the cities after that, they were allowed to have the spoil. He didn't have to covet it to the point we had to have it now. That's the devil's way of operating. The blessing would come eventually. God was going to take care of it. But somehow, he stood there and looked at that, and the Satan whispered to him. Something like what he whispered to Eve. God's not looking out for your best interest. You might never have this opportunity again. Think of what the opportunities this would open you up to. You could be rich. As soon as they get past this city, if you can hide it, then nobody will know where you got it because after this city, everybody's going to be taking gold and silver and then you'll be able to pull it out and use it as regular currency. I'm sure the devil had it all sounded really great in his mind, but he forgot that there was one thing he wasn't thinking about and that was that he had a God who was paying attention and God would pull the blessing and expose him. And God will do that today if He chooses to, and I pray that He does. If there is things like that that go on in our midst, and God's pulling His blessing on our congregation, I pray that He'll do the same thing He did there. You got King Saul, set up first king of Israel. What an opportunity! Bad report. Why did Saul fail? Come back to you, lack of faith in God. If he had faith in God's promises, he would have done exactly what God said. He wouldn't have worried about all the riches of these people and their sheep and oxen. And he wouldn't have worried about the fact that Samuel seems to be coming a little late. I'm going to transgress. Enoch, talked about him. Noah, we talked about him. What about Jonah? He was a prophet. He could have had a good report. He could have been a great figure for what he did when God told him to go talk to Nineveh. And save that whole city. Instead, the king of Nineveh has more respect. I give more respect to him than I do Jonah for what happened. He repented in sackcloth and ashes when he found out what God told him to do. And Jonah took off running. Trying to find something else to do. It's a pretty common, actually, thing for Christians to do. When they feel themselves pulled to do something. You need to go make that right. You need to do this. You need to go witness to that man to get yourself busy. I try to forget about it because if you get yourself busy, you can that opportunity will pass. It's a pretty common tendency. It's a common temptation. Right. And it's the same temptation here that Jonah fell into. I wouldn't advise you take it. But I want to go back right here at the end, and I want to read that sacrifice that Abraham made, and hear what God says about it. And I wanted to challenge you, and I want you to come to a place in your life where if that test comes to you, you can pass that test. Abraham had an excellent walk of faith up to this point. He's called the father of the faithful, and it's not for no reason. So I'd like to take this example from Abraham, of I would call maybe the climax of his test of his life, and that was with Isaac. And so in Genesis chapter 22, you're going to find that account. And it came to pass in verse 1, after these things, that God had tempted Abraham and said unto him, Abraham... And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. We don't see Abraham questioning it. We don't see him. The Bible just says this is what he did. He just, he just said, Yes, Lord, here I am. That's what he told me to do. He rose up early in the morning, and he starts going. Accounting that God was able to raise him up from the dead if he wanted to because he received him in a figure He knew where God where he got him He, he understood he counted the fact of what was going to happen. He understood that God could do something here He also had enough experience with God to know you know what if God's testing me like this 
and God's made all these promises, there's potential for great blessing. Because I've already seen it in the past where I've done this and He acts. And I've done this and He blesses. He had a walk of faith that got him to this point. Otherwise, most people would go, ah, I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, he rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and claved the wood for a burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place which the Lord had told, God had told him of. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And at some point, Abraham sat down with Isaac and explained it all to him. He didn't just take him and manhandle him. And Isaac was willing to submit himself in faith to God, give his life in faith that God had talked to Abraham because he had seen the walk of faith that his Abraham's father had had and the results of obedience that Abraham had had. It had a major effect on Isaac to the point that Isaac, as a young man, was willing to be bound and put on the altar and take the knife. By a testimony that Abraham had to his son, his son would have every reason in the world to question it and think it was an evil thing to do. And it would be an evil thing to do if God had not spoken to Abraham directly. But Abraham had a testimony, and it, that testimony went a long ways for Isaac. And they came to the place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. I wonder if you can come to a point in life where God can say, Now I know. Now I know that thou fearest God. Now I know that you have faith in me. I asked this of you, and you're willing to give it. And you know, he wasn't asking something that Abraham needed to get rid of because it was carnal. He wasn't asking anything like that. He was asking something very dear to his heart that was very good for it to be dear to his heart. It was supposed to be dear to his heart. It was a gift of God, something God gave him. It was very special to him. And God checked and saw and found out that I'm still number one on the list. And God will find that out with each individual heart. If you want to go spend an eternity in God's heaven and spend time with Abraham, go to Abraham's bosom, you will at some point in your life have to prove to God that you are the, that He is the most important thing to you right. over everything Amen. and let Him have it. God, trusting that God is able to make me come out of this situation however he chooses. Trusting that God has my best interest at heart. The amazing thing here is that Abraham's walk of faith brought him to a place where he didn't even question God. There's, there's no record of it. And I believe there would be. He was obedient. And God says, now I know. Now I know for sure. I'm sure God saw that Abraham was probably ready for that test, but it was still a test. Yeah. He was taking him up to the next level in his schooling, and Abraham was keeping right up. For by it the elders obtained a good report. There's no, re no wonder in my mind why Abraham's called the father of the faithful. Some people got the title that they were beloved of their God. Some people got the title... A man after God's own heart. <clears throat> after this, God says, For now I know that thou fearest God. And God did provide a lamb. And he went and offered it. I'm sure with great joy in place. I knew God would come through on it. I knew he'd make something glorious. Now Isaac, look what he got to see. He got to see God call out of heaven. Look what that's going to do for my son Isaac and his relationship with God for future generations. Because I obeyed. So glad I did. But that was so hard. The 
You know, each of us will come to a place where God says, Now I know. If you're walking that path of life, if you're walking that walk of faith, and you're working, that faith is causing you to do things in faith and sacrificing your life for God, and He keeps putting, te putting tests in front of you, there's always things in our life that need to be tested. I'm sure there's things in my life that are dear to me that God will test. And many things we wouldn't be ready for maybe yet. But the test needs to come. You have to prove to God that He is the most important thing so God can say, Now I know that thou fearest God. And then you can enter thou into the joy of my, my Lord. <clears throat> now I know. Is He going to say, now I, now I know that the most important thing to you is yourself? I was trying, I was trying to work with you, I was bringing you to this point, you were coming along and I was kind of watching, I saw the way you were calculating whenever you were asked to do something, how long you paused, and as it got harder, you paused harder, and you kept going, and God knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. He sees the reaction you made, but He will reveal it to you, and He will reveal it to all watching and Himself. And as He pushed it, and He's like, now I know. You see what He did? When it came down to this, that was more important to Him. May that not be said of us. Amen. Young people, it was commitments that I made as a child that set the course of my life. And I desire to help you today to make that commitment. I don't care if you're seven years old or six years old or eight years old and you're listening this morning. Make a commitment to become like these faithful heroes by serving God, by never saying no, by never in your heart rejecting what you know to be truth. Most of the older people here know these principles, and we're, we're in that walk of faith, and we're struggling, and we're trying to pass our tests, and we're trying to move forward to the next harder test. You're in the beginning of your race. There's going to be many times, and the consequences are going to seem little to you, but the consequences aren't little because they will set the course of your life from today and down the road, you will maybe fail a big test or you will maybe win a big victory and become like these people because of steps that you took along the way. They're all going to start out that way. In John 3, 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If you have hope in your heart to become, we don't know what it's going to be. But we know that when he appears, we're going to see him as he is. And we want to be there, and we have hope to be there. If we have that you inside, you have faith, you will act upon that, and you will purify yourself, even as he is pure. You will make your life commitment that. Right. And the trials of this life that we sang about, you see, they seem so long, the trials hard to bear. It's going to be like, those are all just temptations to get me to fall by the way. That's what it is. We're in a spiritual battle. It isn't all about today and tomorrow. It's about the devil's trying to make you think that. It's about the long haul. He just right. wants to get you off that course because he sees that course is going in a good direction. He doesn't like it. So I'm going to conclude with a couple verses here based on what we've been talking about I beseech you with the Apostle Paul by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy young people young boys talking to you you can do this holy acceptable unto God a living sacrifice acceptable unto God not anybody else which is your reasonable service it's reasonable. You think about what all God did for you. You're not sure. Where'd you come from? Who gave you what you have? Who gave you the things that you enjoy? And who has the opportunity to give you much more blessing? It's not the devil. Why do we want to follow what he has to say so bad? Why do we want to go our own way? Did we get us what we have? Did we get us the things that we enjoy? Did the devil get us the things that we enjoy? No, God created it for us. He has the potential a blessing beyond what we can think. We serve God because we love Him. 
And we know that it will be worth it all Amen. when we see Jesus. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You may have to change some of the way you think, some of your thought pattern. You're going to have to teach yourself that when God says move, when I read in the Word of God to honor my parents, when I read in the Word of God to respect authority, to do this or to do that, or when I'm reading the Bible in my personal devotion, which is maybe going to pick up if you're not doing so good on your report card, then it said, I'm prompted to do this. I'm prompted to do this ministry, or I'm prompted to do this, that, or the other. For God, I'm going to teach myself to say yes. I'm going to teach myself to do that. We're not going to think about it. Renew our mind that we may prove, just like these men did, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can prove it in your life. These men did. And you can do it yourself. So, hope I didn't lose you in the middle of that. I know it was kind of just a lot of speaking where it could lose a young mind, but I hope you pay attention. I hope you make a commitment in your heart this morning to walk the walk of faith. Become like one of your heroes. You can, be, you can do that by serving God with all your heart. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand together. Somebody give me the definition of disciple. Following disciplines, set of disciplines. Okay. Someone else put it in their own words. That that's right, but let's let's hear another definition. One per a person who is committed to, to following the teachings and ways of another. Right. And then you pass it on. And and to, for the purpose of passing it on. If I become a disciple of George Washington, it's because I want to pass on the principles that he taught and the life he lived and so forth. I'm going to be a student of that man for the purpose of emulating him and for the purpose of passing on the heritage that he established. Okay, so we are here today and if you are a communion taking member, you are claiming to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your report card look like? A disciple. When you take communion, you are acknowledging the sacrifice that ratified the covenant that you are in, and you are claiming to be a disciple of the one who was crucified for your salvation. That means you are a student of His, you study Him, you learn of Him, you emulate Him, and you pass on. What's your report card look like there? 